Welcome back to talk session four about new communities. And we'll start with Gregory. Thank you. So actually, this is really cool for me because um, I went, when I finished, when I graduated um, from university, uh, the first job I got was at Griffith University. And so I, I moved to Brisbane, I, bet I was here for 10 years. Um, and I worked at, uh, actually founded the Queensland Parallel Supercomputing Facility, which is now QCIF. Um, anyway, that's a long story, but it's really cool to be back and, you know, talking about stuff that we've been doing over the last year or so. Anyway, this talk is, um, I, guess, I guess I don't want to give the impression that, can we, it's really loud, they're getting a bit of feedback, but it's on, yeah. Oh, this one. Um, yeah, I don't want to give the impression that we're like uh, uh, using Galaxy um, uh, like for everything that we do. Okay, we're we're really just transitioning to Galaxy. Um, we're trying to convince our uh, our neutron scattering scientists that Galaxy is a great platform for them, and and so um, just want to preface with that anyway. Let me get on with this. So introduction, I want to talk about some of the challenges. You probably heard from Sergey um, about uh, some of the things that we've been doing. Um, I just want to reiterate that a little bit. Um, talk about some of the workflows that we've actually created um, and then uh, how those workflows fit into where we see the future. Um, and that's the really exciting part and really what I want to talk about. Um, so for people that don't know, Oak Ridge, uh, was formed just after the Manhattan Project. Um, and the idea was to create some nuclear reactors. And so that they, that's where they, it, it all started from. Today, um, it's, uh, it's a pretty massive uh, organization. We have about 6,000 employees. Um, we have uh, many uh, people come to Oak Ridge uh, from all around the world to utilize the facilities that we've got. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty diverse and interesting place to work. Um, so <clears throat> what I wanna talk about today though um, is the neutron sciences facility that we've got. There are actually two um, facilities. One is called the High Flux Isotope Reactor or HIFA for short. Um, and the other is the Spallation Neutron Source. Um, so each one of these facilities produces um, neutrons and people come from all over the world with their, their bits of uh, crystals and materials and things and stick them in the neutron beam and they um, figure out what happens to the neutrons and that lets them in turn figure out what the structure of those materials are. And this is uh, really important for material science, for things like uh, coming up with new battery technologies or other kinds of technologies. They, uh, this is what it's being used for. Now, uh, each of these instruments has around, uh, these facilities has around 30 instruments um, attached to it. So the neutron beam um, gets deflected and you know the, the beam lines go to different kinds of instruments and they give you different um, information about the material. So there's diffraction, there's imaging, there's reflectometry, there's a whole bunch of different things. Um, and so it's quite a, it's quite a complicated facility. Now, uh, for the for data analysis, okay, the, there's a lot of challenges. Uh, Sergey talked to, about um, some of these yesterday, um, but really uh, the main thing is that we have um, 30 plus instruments each instrument has multiple data analysis workflows. So we're talking about maybe 60 or more uh, data analysis workflows um, for, uh, you know, for all the instruments in the facility. And currently, um, pre-Galaxy, it's all manual. So um, people had to get their data uh, once it came off the instrument, they have to move it to somewhere where they can run some compute on it, they can run a, a simulation or do a modeling, do some kind of modeling, uh, and eventually produce a, you know, some kind of image that then they can uh, kind of uh, figure out what the properties of their material is. And so even though a lot of science has been done at the lab, it's, 
it's been slow and painstaking, right? And so what, we're, what we see the value of, of, of something like Galaxy is accelerating this. Um, so there's some other challenges like uh, uh, conflicts with, with compute resources, um, the fact that we've got multiple administrative and security domains and it's a total and utter mess about you know, how you access compute resources and all this kind of stuff. So these are all challenges as well, but they're more about uh, how we utilize Galaxy. Um, Sergey presented this, uh, so I won't go into it, but we have an architecture now that we think um, is pretty good. Um, and uh, is going to uh, at least meet our needs in the short term. And uh, if people want to know more about the details of this, we're happy to talk about that. And this is all this is all open source, so people can utilise it. Um, we have uh, so we've been going for about eighteen months in, in this one project. We've created uh, twenty five, uh, roughly twenty five tools in that amount of time, um, which uh, correspond to six workflows. So, you know, we haven't really even got to the 30 workflows yet. You know, we're only up to six. Um, and uh, so, but we are making progress. And so uh, that's, been, that's been good. And, and the, fund, the people that are funding our project are, are pretty happy with what we've done so far. Uh, we've made some decisions like um, all our tools are Dockerized uh, containers, um, except for the ones that run on the HPC systems where we're using Singularity. Um, we, uh, you know, we're trying to be uh, very standardised uh, what we do because we're going to have so many of these tools eventually in so many workflows. Um, and, you know, we have things like we have tools written in Fortran. Um, we use uh, like OpenMP and MPI and things like that, which really complicate um, how you run a, just run a tool. Like we're not just running our tools on, you know, a, a, a simple a compute farm or something. You know, we have all this, this kind of stuff that has to happen as well. And it, so it's quite complicated. Anyway, but we're, we're making good progress. So now I want to just switch a little bit to some of the workflows. I'm not going to go into the details. Uh, I mean, number one, I don't really even understand the, the physics behind all this stuff. Um, but what I want to focus on is what we've achieved with our workflows. So, so this particular workflow, um, which is for analysing these quantum materials. This runs on Summit, which is the fifth largest supercomputer in the world. Um, and we have this running on 6,000 CPUs and it still takes 24 hours to run. Um, so we could even scale it up further. But the uh, important point here is the first, uh, these four main tools here, um, they run on Summit. Um, and so they need MPI, they need the HPC, the GPUs and everything that, that Summit has. The last two steps um, don't need uh, HPC resources. And so we don't want to run them on Summit. We want to run them on our cloud, our on-prem cloud, for example. Um, so we've, with this workflow, we've been able to demonstrate for the first time ever, really uh, being able to run a neutron scattering workflow on our own HPC resources, but across multiple types of resources, okay, from, from HPC to, to cloud. Um, so that sort of verifies the architecture in a way. Um, but also, I'll get into why this is really important. Uh, we have another workflow uh, that has machine learning components in it. Um, so this uses PyTorch, I think, behind the scenes. I think this uh, the big box there is a training step. So every time you run this workflow, it actually trains the, the neural net as well as then uses it to speed up the, the actual um, uh, simulation. Um, so it's kind of a training and application of the, of the network at the same time. Um, but, the, but the point here is that, you know, we've been able to integrate with, with um, machine learning and artificial intelligence into the, the workflow. Um, and so that's got some really interesting, um, exciting possibilities in the future. Um, Monte Carlo ray tracing analysis. So this is, uh, a demonstration of using a uh, what what they call a digital twin. So it's essentially a simulation of an instrument. Um, so we can actually uh, using the Monte Carlo ray tracing, where we're we're um, simulating where a neutron goes, or thousands or millions of neutrons, and we can actually simulate what would happen to uh, a particular sample. So with this workflow, we have uh, essentially a software version of the facility. So just just 
you know, keep that in the back of your mind um, and what the implications of that could be. But this, is, this has demonstrated that we can do that with, with, um, with Galaxy. Um, the last one I wanted to, to look at is uh, this cross facility one. I mentioned that you know, we're already able to, to run on HPC resources um, and our on-prem cloud. Um, this, is an, this is an example of us being able to do that um, end to end. And, but also with the capability of going intra facility as well. So ultimately what we want to be able to do is run a workflow, not only just internally on the, on the Oak Ridge facility, but on another facility as well. So we, we're working with uh, some of the other light sources, for example, which do different kinds of um, uh, physics. So there's like uh, there's the X-ray sources and and other light sources which give you different information about um, the materials. And so if we can run experiments that go you know span not only uh, our facility but other facilities, then that also opens up some really interesting uh, uh, capabilities. So. This is really what I wanted to talk about, uh, which is what we can do with all those technologies that I've just talked about. So we've, we've demonstrated this capability um, of, uh, so let me just here. So we can leverage um, our distributed resources, our massive, uh, massively parallel supercomputers. We also have edge resources, which are compute resources close to the instruments as well. So using Galaxy, we can, we can leverage all those. Um, we can incorporate machine learning models um, and AI tools into the workflows. We've demonstrated that capability. Uh, we can connect to other labs and other facilities um, to run cross-facility experiments. Um, we have the digital twin capability. So in addition to running real experiments, we can run simulated experiments. Um, so for example, if someone else is using the machine, uh, the actual facility, but you still want to run an experiment, you can do a, you can do a simulation of the experiment. And that can also help you set up the parameters for your actual real experiment when you want to do that. So there's a lot of benefits of being able to do uh, digital twins. And so by combining all these together with our workflows that are driven by Galaxy, so Galaxy will be driving the workflows at the edge. So for example, when we capture data from the, uh, from the instruments and we need to process that data so that we can use it for doing data analysis, um, Galaxy will be doing that. And it will also be running workflows for the whole experiment as well. So driving the different instruments, getting the, collecting the data, analyzing the data, sending it out to the HPC resources, all that kind of thing. And so really this provides an unprecedented opportunity for doing experiments in material science. So this has never been, it's a capability that's never been possible before. And so we're actually now uh, submitting funding proposals to build this facility. So this will be like, uh, the experimental facility of the future for neutron material sciences. And, and so none of that would have been possible without something like Galaxy, or we would have had to have build, built a, you know, a Galaxy replacement ourselves in order to be able to do this. Uh, so, you know, to me, that is, um, that shows you uh, the versatility of Galaxy and how it can be adapted to, you know, to other types of environments. Uh, but also the fact that when it was designed, it was done in a way that, you know, is not, it, it's not uh, specific to any particular domain. And so we can leverage it to build, you know, these kinds of uh, capabilities in the future. So it's, it's a pretty exciting future, I think. Um, so, yeah, with that, um, I just to like to acknowledge uh, a bunch of people that have been involved. Um, this is really 18 months, uh, but you know, we've had a lot of people involved uh, from both the domain science side and um, on the software engineering and computer science side. So it's been a, it's been a big team of people. And uh, thank you.
Come. So, timing work. Thank you, Gregory. And next, Ennis is speaking. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Um, I want to talk about a, a bit of a sort of a future facing um, developments that are planned over uh, the next five years or so with respect to the uh, ANVIL project that was uh, mentioned in the, in the past uh, uh, session and, and, and also. Um, I guess uh, if we take a look at what we've heard a lot about thus far is about the accessibility of Galaxy. We've heard quite a bit about uh, uh, the used Galaxy services that offer this unprecedented ability for uh, people to just log on and start operating on data uh, across around the world. And, and it, this is phenomenal for all the, the training infrastructure, for all the open data that, that exists out there. Um, so that's one sort of prong of how Galaxy increases the accessibility. Uh, the other one is a, you know, an example of what the, the talk we've just heard, where it's this highly customizable, very powerful local installation uh, of a Galaxy instance that works great for these specialized tasks or, or larger teams. And then the, the sort of the third prong um, is this what originated as sort of Galaxy on the cloud as a way to sort of leverage technologies uh, without having to deal with the infrastructure itself. Uh, and, and over time, that has now kind of evolved into this Galaxy uh, on Anvil uh, as a way to offer Galaxy instances to operate on sensitive and protected data that uh, is otherwise very difficult to uh, obtain. Uh, and so we've seen this slide popped up a couple of times already today. So uh, Anvil as a project has been in existence for five years now, uh, and it's building this sort of a, a, a a data repository today sits at about five petabytes of predominantly NHGRI, uh, it's a branch of NIH, uh, sort of human data, uh, genetic data, um, that, that's easily ingestible into the software that runs on this platform. So the software that we have includes, that, that's available on Anvil, uh, this sort of includes Galaxy as one of the apps, but, but it, there's also Jupyter, Bioconductor, integration with the doc store for methods sharing, uh, Whittle and Cromwell for batch analyses. And so it's this uh, library or lab uh, of software that you can use to operate on the data. So pick your own um, selections. And then there's the, the community aspect, of course, to sort of uh, uh, mimic a lot of the activities around uh, from Galaxy. Uh, we've heard Natalie talk earlier about the GDSCN uh, efforts as a way to, uh, to, to, to increase the diversity of, of people that this, this unique platform is available. Um, and all this runs in this FedRAMP environment that, that gives us the guarantees uh, of working with sensitive and protected data sets. Again, something that is otherwise very, very expensive, very difficult and unattainable to most um, uh, individuals and groups. And in this case, it's, it's, it's ready. Um, and so that's what, what we've spent the last five years working on. So anvilproject.org gives us uh, uh, you know, an overview if you wanna uh, check that out. And then if you want to actually try Galaxy and, and work on some of the protected data sets, that's at the uh, anvil.terra.bio URL. And uh, what we're uh, kicking off this month is what we're referring to as the uh, Anvil phase two. We are awaiting that notice of award that Mike mentioned, but uh, it's hopefully coming any minute now. Uh, and that'll carry us through the next five years. And so I want to go through these uh, sort of main activities um, that are planned for these this phase two so that people are sort of uh, in or we can be in sync with the rest of the community and develop things uh, you know collaboratively. Uh, so the four things the four activities that, that we're uh, focusing on is sort of uh, increasing the usage uh, and that we do that by um, improving the UX uh, for, for users when I lower the cost because here people do actually pay for what they use. Uh, streamline how people interact with Galaxy through some machine learning and, and AI uh, methods of made of, by be making them available in Galaxy and then uh, improve the interoperability uh, of Anvil with, with other similar platforms. And so taking a, a slightly deeper look at this, again, this is all forward facing. So most of this is, is not done, it's certainly not in Anvil, uh, even though some of these components actually are starting to pop up in, in Galaxy proper already. Uh, so as far as improving the, the user experience, uh, so 
uh, the day Galaxy is considered as an interactive platform on Anvil, um, and, and all of batch workflows are done through Terra. However, not all of the, um, oh, sorry, not, Whittle workflows, but not all of the Whittle workflows exist, um, or some of the Galaxy workflows don't exist in Whittle. So want to make sure that you can um, run those workflows in an, an easy batch format that would help with scalability. Um, when enhance how users interact with Galaxy today, that's fairly clunky. It takes about 10 minutes uh, to get going. We're going to get that down to uh, you know seconds, preferably. Um, second is, of course, this cost-efficient computing element. Uh, you pay for every minute that you run on Anvil. And as you scale up, uh, making sure that we can dynamically scale resources, uh, you know, something that you think comes for granted on, on the cloud, uh, it doesn't today. So that's a, a step in the forward direction. And then uh, leveraging data local computing, again, uh, some of the, the, the work that's already been done in Galaxy, just hooking it up. The sort of, uh, 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 some of the more interesting things that haven't been talked about thus far are, are these recommender systems. Um, so again, with thousands of tools that exist in, in the tool shed and, um, and in Galaxy, how do you select a, a, a more suitable one? There's been some preliminary work in Europe done uh, on this topic. So again, integrating that, taking it to the sort of next level, including some parameter sweep uh, options, particularly when it comes to the machine learning uh, methods. And then, uh, you know, if we can predict what individual tool you might want to run next, uh, we'll just say, well, we can, we can also experiment with being able to auto draft workflows uh, and give you some subset of tools that a, a particular flow uh, might, uh, might fit. And then uh, the last sort of set of activities is this uh, multi-cloud support. Uh, so we're moving from Google Cloud where all this has been deployed over the past five years to Azure, um, and then increasing the, the use of GA4, GH APIs, again, some of which have now been implemented in, in, uh, in Galaxy, but not at all in the, uh, in the Anvil version. Uh, and with that, um, I said this is a collaborative effort between the Broad and Hopkins as the main institutions uh, running this, this program. Thank you. Mary is next. Okay. Um, so, hi everyone. Can you hear me well? So uh, I'm here today as a representative of uh, the French biodiversity data hub infrastructure for Galaxy Ecology. And, uh, <laughs> and so the Galaxy Ecology is a transnational initiative for research and expertise on biodiversity. So it's in the, the context of eco-informatics where we have a lot of information about time from the time of publication to the death of investigate investigators and the degradation of the data throughout times. Uh, this degradation is um, uh, um, over more um, important uh, with all the links that the, the different data has um, among themselves. So in order to um, fight this uh, degradation of data and this loss of information, uh, we, the goal of Galaxy Ecology is to enhance rep reproducibility. So okay. Galaxy Ecology is supported since 2018 by the French Biodiversity Data Hub Infrastructure, or in short, PNDB. So the PNDB uh, wants to make available data and metadata. They are um, trying to identify knowledge gaps and facilitate communication. And finally, they are promoting products and services at multiple scales, so regional, national, and uh, international. Uh, so right now, they are going to um, integrate the uh, infrastructure, the research infrastructure, Data Terra, as the fifth pole, fifth domain uh, in between the in the atmosphere, the uh, solid solid uh, earth ocean and uh, the last uh, domain which is uh, continental superspecies. So in ecology for now there is currently huge R script that are used to do uh, ecology analysis and with uh, Galaxy the huge uh, improvement will be to have multiple uh, tools uh, with the uh, when we divide the huge R script which will um, enable to users to use different tools in different, um, with different uh, data sets. 
So it's uh, improving the reusability and the interoperability. Uh, for instance, in the data management, the PNDB put multiple uh, tools in place throughout R&D projects. So for instance, we have MetaShark that helps create ecological metadata language files. Or recently they added MetaShrimp that automates productions of per metrics and data paper sketch for, from ecological metadata language based on metadata documents. But there are also non-interactive tools like XML Starlet, Metadef, XR, and Metadata Info, Jedal Information, OGR Information, and a last tool that validates uh, the ISO 19139. So uh, from this uh, tool to that, that manage data, we also have a new workflow that were implemented during the last years. So uh, for instance, we have these uh, four new workflows, so one on biodiversity data exploration, one on load sensing that I explained uh, quickly yesterday, one on turnover boulder biodiversity indicators, and the last one that was this, that is recently implemented on ecoregionalization of the sea du Mont -Durville. So the first one, biodiversity data exploration workflow, is a workflow that allows you to have a complete overview of your biodiversity data, you have a kind of state of the art of uh, your data. You can make uh, analysis and statistic checks to be sure that your data are correct and uh, can also view some variables in your data. Uh, the next one is the turnover boulder field analysis where you have th four three indicators that allow you to see the pressure of uh, food fishing uh, on uh, boulders, so if the picture is detailed here. Uh, it allows you to also to uh, calculate the diversity um, impact of food fishing on uh, the boulder field. So this project uh, is in the, the goal of this project is to make an experimentation for sustainable and concerted management of recreational food fishing in France. So all of this um, workflow is available on the Galaxy Training Network and explained. And uh, the final workflow is the ecoregionization of the Sea du Mont Durville. So the goal of this workflow is to propose an accessible, reproducible, and transparent IT solution for the processing and analysis of occurrence data applicable to the concept of ecosystem conservation in Antarctica. So the main step of this workflow is modelization of species distribution, then the taxon selection. From this, you can determine the optimal number of cluster with the silhouette index, and then make the clusterization. And with the final map here, you can have the visualization of the ecoregion. So here, for instance, you have five of these ecoregions. Uh, it will soon be on Galaxy Training Network 2. So in conclusion, the Galaxy Ecology instance allows to uh, have a solution for citizens to comprehend the extent of their contribution and appreciate what is an ecologist's work. And I'll leave you on the beautiful picture of the marine station of Concarneau where the PNDB is working. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. We have time for one question. Uh, sorry, uh, how does boulder turning work? So you turn the boulder and count how many things you have there, and that's like an indicator of uh, diversity? Yeah, uh, you have multiple ones. You have a indicator to see when the, the boulder is turned over, if the diversity has changed between the, up, the upside and the downside, and you have like a fixed boulder that is the reference point, and you see the diversity from this reference point with the other boulders that are turn, turned over. Thank you again. Thank you. Our next speaker is Wendy.
Hello, Galaxy community. So I am thrilled to be speaking on behalf of the brand new single cell community of practice. We seem to be growing every single week. A new institute is joining. Today we build a very big bridge between Europe and Australia. So hopefully we can get more of our teammates across the community together. So this really started with the problem that we identified. So single cell analysis, as someone who does it, obviously I'm very keen on it. So it's a really cutting edge field in bioinformatics. We're constantly having new tools, new tool suites, new uh, technologies, new users, new uses. There's so much to do in this field. And Galaxy has a little bit of an awkward history here where we managed to wrap the exact same tool suite twice. So we'd really like to avoid that going forward. There's a lot to do. This is something that came out of running one single cell training course for 30 students. And this is not even a comprehensive list of the different tools, workflows, and tutorial requests that came out of that single training course. We have a lot of work to do. We cannot be duplicating effort going forward. The other thing that we found is a lot of our users would be finding tools that seemed familiar. They looked like single cell tools and are in the different uh, also, shout out to the tool search, thank God that that has improved, okay? But they were finding all these different single cell tools, but what turned out is that they were often used by a single group that were pre-processing their data outside of Galaxy and then using that for a very specific way, which meant that users couldn't use it. So, and this is so frustrating for me as a trainer, because it seems like 90% of the work is done, you've wrapped the tool, the tool functions, but it's that 10% of making it work with the workflow, that 10% of talking to the user and just just fixing, making a little bit less codey, adding a little help text, that is the difference between me being able to say, here you go, user, or me being able to say, avoid that one, it doesn't work, right? So close to glory. So why do we need a community of practice? I feel like we may need to turn the volume down for me. <laughs> it's just like on Zoom meetings as well, I have this problem. So why do we need a community of practice? Well, obviously, who doesn't love another meetings? Uh, also, single cell analysis is cool, right? Uh, we are asking really exciting questions. What are the different cell types in an eye? Or how do cell types get affected distinctly in disease? How are cell types affected distinctly by treatments or by drugs or by whatever parameter you're interested in? We're asking very cool questions. So obviously, we need a community. Of course, we need to prevent work duplication. And whilst we're there and we have all of these people across different institutes, different disciplines, we might as well use that. I'm a big believer that trainers are your best user advocates. We are the people that see problems, log the problems, and also follow up on the problems. So if we can connect these trainers who are these user advocates with the developers, we can really fulfill this pipeline of making things usable. And all of that comes to outreach. I can then you know, pimp out all of the different single cell tools for people who've never encountered Galaxy a lot easier when I know that they're working together. How do we function? So this is what I'm really hoping to get advice from you all throughout this conference, because we sort of put this together to avoid this problem going forward. And I really don't want to add a meeting to anyone's docket that's not efficient or useful or ideally, God forbid, enjoyable, right? So we meet every six weeks. We've finally added ourselves to the Galaxy Workflows calendar after a number of time zone issues. We're going to start having an Aussie Brisbane friendly time in our every third meeting is going to actually be useful for y'all. All right, we've got a team forum on Element, which we're finally all added to. The Gitter to Element transition did not treat the single cell community well, um, but that's hopefully sorted. We've got a rolling notes. We almost went to a GitHub uh, issues board or uh, project board, but we ended up sticking with the Google Doc for now where we're putting people together. Um, I send out post meeting notes. I automate it so they get sent out three weeks later so I don't have to follow up on anyone and make sure they're working. And then we get an email as well reminding people of the actual meetings. Our templates are pretty simple for how we run a meeting. We always have new people, so we always start with the introductions to get people to know each other. We then go through updates where people are saying what they're working on to prevent work duplication. I think my favorite bit is putting people together when people are finding issues and need them to be solved. And so we're starting to make little element subgroups when we're having people working across different institutes together to fix these problems or follow up with the user needs. And then, of course, we have, which you slightly can't see, the other cool stuff that we get involved in. So smorgasbord being a fantastic example of this. People in all different institutes, we all you know, agreed who was doing what, who was captioning what, in order to then make sure that we had a nice array of materials available for smorgasbord. 
it seemed fitting, I've got to say, when I saw this on the you know, State of Galaxy talk, it made me very happy about the way that I like to title things. So that was quite nice, which I sometimes get a bit of flack for in England for not being, you know, I don't know, Attenborough enough. Um, so cool stuff we have. I had to give a shout out to obviously my students, Julia and Marisa, who did some amazing talks today. Um, I think the coolest thing that's happening in Galaxy for Single Cell is we uh, had a very amicable divorce from Transcriptomics last year, um, <laughs> which is very important because we've gone multiomic. So now we've got chromatin happening, we've got protein, we've got spatial, which I think you're going to be uh, you know, seeing more. There's posters I didn't even look at that are here. Um, so just lots of cool things are happening in this area, and it's only going to get more exciting going forward. Um, yes, that was Marisa. That was for you. Otherwise, I'd be a bad supervisor, and they'd kick me out. I think the other thing that is exciting is when we all get put in a room together, we all start to dream together, right? So we have a whole bunch of different things that we want to look at going forward. Better visualization, we saw the learning pathways, which was the bomb. We have more than a week's worth of materials, so we're going to have to make separate learning pathways for what people want. We want to see multiomic and spatial single cell analysis, you know, grow. I think something as a trainer I'm very excited about is having multi-languages for the same tutorial. So if we're thinking about Galaxy as a gateway to learning to code, what if we start them with the buttons and then move them on to doing it in our notebook as opposed to starting with in our notebook, right? Can we make that a little bit more accessible for people? So, here are a bunch of links, since you all have access to the slides anyway. If you'd like to join our mailing group, which we've just gotten, thank you, Nate. Uh, help us run better. I'd really love to hear your thoughts on that. We've got the matrix group going on, and then also I'm just going to give a shout out to a couple of PhD students who are just very ready with some surveys. So if you have anything going on in the training space, we'd really love to talk to your participants. I didn't want to get dinged, yeah. Thank you, Andy. Our next speaker is Anthony. Hello, hello, can you hear me? Cool. So I'm Anthony Brotodo. I'm working in uh, France, in Rennes, um, and I'm gonna talk about um, genome annotation in Galaxy. So we have this group uh, named Galaxy Genome Annotation, uh, which is a community born in 2017. And our goal is to ease the annotation of genome um, within Galaxy. So we work on tools, workflow, visualization, training, and all material to, uh, to ease annotation. So we have a website on uh, github.io and um, a subdomain on usegalaxy.eu. Um, so first, just in one slide, what is genome annotation for those who don't know? Uh, in fact, there are there are two types. The first one is structural genome annotation. So in this step, we will try to find the position of the gene along the, the, the sequence of a new genome. So that's really important because it's the base for many, many applications afterwards. Uh, for transcriptomic, epigenetics, comparative genomics, you need to have well-defined genes um, properly defined by, uh, by, uh, by software. And in, in it's not an easy problem for software because uh, these genes have some motifs to recognize them on the genome. The, these motifs are very short and not very specific, so software have trouble finding these genes. So often they need some uh, evidence data like RNAC data or alignment of proteins from uh, other species. And the second step when you finish the structural annotation is the functional annotation. Um, in, this, in this step, you will try to uh, assign function to these genes based on the sequence. So we'll try to look at known motifs or or similarity with known uh, sequence uh, to give names and symbols and attach some uh, gene ontology terms to each uh, predicted gene. So we have a full catalog of uh, annotation tools that are available now in Galaxy. Most of them uh, were, uh, were uploaded, uh, were pushed to IUC. So you have tools for repeat detection, like repeat modeler and masker, uh, red, and you have uh, structural annotation tools for prokaryotes and eukaryotes. You have functional annotation tools like uh, scary ones like uh, interproscans and um, eggnog mapper. And you have other um, utility tools like uh, Busco to, to make some quality assessment of uh, your annotation. And alignment tools like Blast, Exonerate, Diamond, Maniprod to align sequences along the genome and compare it to the annotation. Uh, you can also um, annotate other things that, than genes like tRNA or here a long non-coding RNA with a FNC. Uh, just to focus on two new tools that are um, coming to Galaxy uh, these weeks. Uh, the first one is Helixer, which is a new new tool based on deep learning. 
And this one is great because it doesn't need uh, any evidence to predict genes along the sequence. And it uses GPU, it's super fast. Uh, from the first test, it seems to work great on some genomes and not so great on others, but it's quite a new and interesting way to annotate genomes. So it's, it was merged uh, last week and it's, uh, we are currently testing it on usegalaxy.fr and we will deploy it on other usegalaxy later. And the second one is uh, Breaker 3 uh, that should be merged in the coming days. Uh, that's a new version of Breaker that supports um, both RNA-seq and protein evidence at once, which was not possible before. And uh, it seems to give great results too, so it should be in Galaxy uh, pretty soon. So what's so special about annotation uh, tools uh, in Galaxy? Well, these tools are often big pipelines um, that, them, that run a, a lot of subcommands. Uh, some of them are quite old, so it uh, gave some packaging issues, especially with Perl. I, uh, I have uh, great memories about that. And um, yeah, for computing, it uses a lot of subcommands that are launched in parallel, which is not very easy to debug when it crashes. Sometimes, some of them uses M MPI, like Maker. And most of them also use a big reference database, like uh, tens or hundreds of gigabytes that need to be updated regularly with the data manager, which is uh, not super um, cool. And the last problem, which is really annoying, is the, um, that some uh, software or subcommands may have some um, non-free or strange license, which make it quite difficult to make uh, fair tools and fair workflows. Uh, so that's really a, a problem because, yeah, you can easily distribute the workflow and testing it automatically is not easy uh, also. So we have made some uh, fields like this to try to work around this problem. For GeneMark, for example, you can upload your own license when you run the tool. Or for uh, Interproscan, you can choose to use the non-free components or not, depending on what you want to do. Uh, that's it for the tools. We have also some specific tools for visualization of annotation. So um, here you can see Jebra, so from Galaxy you can generate a genome browser uh, by loading your assembly and annotation and RNSC track or whatever track you have. And uh, yeah, generate it in Galaxy, have it in your story and share it with anyone you want. You can do the same with Circos at the top to generate a colorful uh, plots like this. And recently I've worked on Gene Notebook here that allows to um, to deploy a small web app to explore functional annotation on different uh, genes. So you have uh, also nice uh, alignments of motifs and si similarity uh, on, on, uh, on genes. So based on all these tools and visualization, we have some workflows that are available. So you can get from the assembly that you've done in Galaxy to uh, a structural annotation, a functional one, and then visualization of all these results. And so these workflows are, are available right now, either on GTN or uh, we are trying also to deposit them on uh, IWC. Okay, that's it for the tools and workflows. Um, there's another nice thing about annotation. Well, nice. Uh, there's a problem <laughs> is that automatic annotation are never perfect. Uh, as I said, the motifs on the genome are not really uh, strong. They are often uh, short and not very specific. So you, every time you will make a structural annotation, you will always get errors, genes that are not complete, exons that are missing, or genes that were fused that shouldn't be. Uh, so on some genome sequencing projects, you often want to perform a manual curation um, step. So you ask to, to your friends to look at the predicted genes and see if there are errors. So usually you do it for some gene families where you have some experts able to, to detect these errors. And so we have um, uh, implemented Apollo, which is a web app, uh, which, which can be summarized as the Google Doc of annotation. So it looks like this. You can look at specific genes and with the mouse, uh, change the limits of exon, entrons, or, or, or the whole gene. You can give names to the genes. Uh, and this is um, collaborative and multi-user in real time, which means everyone working on the same genome sees what the others are doing in, in, in real time. So this is available on, as a self-service uh, on uh, usegalaxy.eu slash Apollo. So anyone can come with his genome, his annotation, uh, launch a new manual creation project and give access to his friend on the server uh, 
and uh, produce a new release of the annotation uh, manually curated. Uh, so Apollo is a part of uh, Gmod family of tools, but we have worked also on other tools. Uh, JBrowse is also in Gmod. We have worked on Shadow, Triple, which are a uh, web interface to display, to make web portals displaying um, annotation to users. So we've worked on Docker images for this application, Python libraries, uh, command line interface, and Galaxy tools using this uh, command line interface to, to load data and to uh, make it available to other uh, users. And of course, we have a lot of training material uh, available. So we use all the possibility of the, of the GTN with slides, tutorial, workflows, videos, and um, two new learning paths we've added uh, two weeks ago, I think. Uh, so that's the output of the Gallantries EU uh, project that is finishing in uh, two months. Um, and one thing that is interesting is that it seems to be a topic that is quite popular for people. So. If you look at the participants to the smorgasbord, there was a form uh, at the registration where people can, could say which topic interested them. And two thirds of users um, checked the genome annotation uh, topic, which is quite uh, good. And in, during the whole week, we had uh, 3,000 page views and more than 200 uh, video views. So it is uh, quite uh, great. And now for annotation in Galaxy, there are some um, interesting projects, uh, VGP, Erga, BG, Atlassi. Uh, these projects are a big sequencing project where, where the, the, uh, the members try to sequence tens of thousands of genomes of different uh, kind of species. Uh, so you have already uh, seen what has been done for the assembly of uh, genome in VGP. So you have some workflows available. Now the next step is to take this genome and try to annotate them uh, in Galaxy with similar workflows and try to be able to treat as many genomes in a scalable and fair way. Um, so there are a few challenges. Um, first, the availability of um, evidences data, as I said earlier, to often to have a good um, annotation, you need uh, RNA-seq data. And these projects uh, often plan to have RNA-seq data, but a bit later after the assembly of genomes. So for now, most of them, uh, of these RNA-seq data are not uh, available yet. Also, we'll need to have some standard workflow for all these genomes, but probably we will need to have some phylum-specific workflows because some annotation tools work for some species and will not work or need some special tweaking for other species. So we'll need to work on that. Um, there's also the problem of having a quality check metrics to determine which annotation is the best for a genome. So either by looking at BUSCO statistics, uh, the gene number, length, or the exon um, count, uh, the mean exon count of genes, for example. So that's a big, um, a big uh, work to do. And there is some computing challenge also. So we are, we are um, partner of the Euroscience Gateway with a specific use case on the annotation and biodiversity. So the, the goal is to be able to annotate all these genomes using Pulsar endpoint in the European um, infrastructure. So there are different projects. VGP is the international, ERGA, European, BGA2. Atlassi is a French uh, project. And so um, all of them have the same goal. So we'll need to have some coordination between the community, communities to, to work on the same uh, workflows. And just to finish, maybe the next step, the next next step uh, would be to, uh, for all these genome, after having an auto automatic annotation, to be able to provide a manual curation infrastructure and some um, web portal data exploration um, uh, systems. So we have started a project with a few colleagues, which is named Boris. So this, the principle is to have some uh, well, it's genome portal as a service. So the, 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 the main goal is to be able for a set of uh, assembly and annotation to easily just uh, in a few click and a few uh, configuration to deploy a whole website like this, proposing a standard service like uh, Apollo uh, instance, uh, JBrows, uh, JBrows website, uh, Blast uh, server, um, and uh, Gene Notebook, for example. So we, in fact, this is based on writing a YAML file on the left, uh, describing all your data, data you have for a specific species, and then using um, um, CI uh, process in GitLab and, um, and GGA workflows to generate all these uh, portals in, uh, automatically. 
So we plan to use it for Atlassi to be able to put online all the data of this project in a, an automatic way and, uh, and still user-friendly for the biologist. That's it. Thanks for, uh, for listening and thanks to all these people who are contributing in any way to, to this. Thank you, Anthony. We have time for a couple of questions. Anthony, I've heard from the VGP people that uh, genome annotation is missing. Do you see there an opportunity? Is missing? Yeah, yeah, surely. Yeah, you need, to, as I said, we need absolutely to synchronize between all this project and to propose the same workflows between the different community and um, yeah yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm wondering about the uh, uh, metadata for genome annotations once you have managed to create them uh, how are they uh, um, searchable and what metadata standards or uh, did you have solutions for that part uh, yeah that's that's important uh, yeah um, Part of the solution for me will be that because for Atlassi, for example, we'll have a lot of genomes that will be um, tracked in a specific database. And we plan to use this to generate this kind of YAML file using basic uh, uh, metadata extracted from this database. And also based on that to be able to generate our create uh, data to deposit them on Zenodo or things like that uh, easily. Yeah. That's, one, that's on our roadmap. Maybe not uh, next year, but... Uh, yeah. Thanks very much. Our last speaker is Katerina. There you go. Thank you very much for you and a bit of fresh air. And I'm going to talk to you about this from a very different angle. So my name is Katerina Heil and I represent Elixir here at the meeting today. We have a lot of communities in our infrastructure. I'm going to very briefly present you who we are and then what our communities do. So. Elixir is an intergovernmental organization that brings together life science resources. And some of these are databases, software tools, training materials, interoperability resources, compute resources, as well as data management support. And what we try to do is to make all these virtual things a federated infrastructure. So a single go-to place for researchers and people like you to find all of this. So we are 24 different nodes, that's basically equivalent to 24 countries. And within those countries, it's about 245 institutes and universities that are contributing to this. And we're coordinating all the efforts from one central office. The coordinating activities for Elixir are happening in this secretariat, which we also call the Elixir hub. And we're all about a network of people and together we accelerate the understanding of life. So again, it's about connecting national infrastructures to mobilize data for life sciences in the European research area and beyond. So whatever we have is open source and that makes it accessible to all of you as well. How do we do this? We have five central platforms. They're looking at topics such as compute, data, tools, interoperability and training. And per se, they really build the infrastructure. They host the things that the researchers and the end users, but also the intermediate users need. So these here are things like cloud compute storage and access to services. We're looking at robust, long-term, sustainable data resources. When it comes to tools, it's all about finding them, registering them and benchmarking them, and also looking at best practices for tool development. And in the space of interoperability, we can mentioned some of the words like discoverability, accessibility, but also integration and analysis of biological data, looking at standardized formats, metadata and vocabularies. And in the scope of training, it's really the training infrastructure and bringing the capacity to our members to train the researchers and the individuals that want to be using some of our resources and tools. And this is now our communities portfolio. We have about 17 different communities and this is maybe also where you as the Galaxy community have different communities. They look at different things. You can see the vast diversity of, of areas that Elixir communities are looking at. So that reaches or ranges from research data management, which is our newest established community, 
plant sciences, we have people that look at rare diseases, microbial biotechnology, and one of these communities is also the galaxy community. So communities are formed around domain experts in Elixir nodes, but we're also very welcoming to non-Elixir members as partners in our communities. And they provide a mechanism for long-term collaborations with others and other projects and communities like yours as well. Our communities drive service developments in the Elixir platforms, and they provide a framework to develop and maintain community standards. This is just a different summary of how our communities work, and, and the one to highlight potentially is also supporting collaborative standards and development. So it's really about having community-driven um, approaches here. And we're always very interested in a bi-directional conversation to all of this. So the people that have the technology and the users and the user representatives in our communities that are really applying what our platforms are supplying and vice versa. So I have two slides for you on our Galaxy community. You know this much better um, than I do, but this is kind of how we are pitching um, those connections in our context as well. So the Elixir Galaxy community fosters a Galaxy community in Europe, beyond Galaxy Europe or together with um, Galaxy Europe, um, and then together with Galaxy resources and training. And again, it monitors and fosters the use of Galaxy within Elixir as well. Every community has defined goals. Every community has leads. Two of them are in the room here today. So Frederick and Bjorn and Nicola might have been online. I've seen his picture on some of your screenshots as well. So many of you probably do know um, of Nicola or have met him in the past. And just some of the highlights that we are also very happy about and um, showcase in our Elixir context when it comes to Galaxy. I'm not going to talk through this slide because I think we've heard and seen really good examples in the last hours, which I have also thoroughly enjoyed so far. I did want to highlight this slide and really also say that it, it's always about the bigger community. So Elixir collaborates with the Australian Bio Commons, and that's how um, Elixir also comes into play in the communities. So that's really for sharing technical expertise, but also giving both organizations a more global perspective. And I think Galaxy is also right in the middle there. One last example, the Bio Hackathon. Um, that is an event that is supported and run by Elixir in Europe. And here again, it's really the people from the communities that drive the projects, they make them happen and they implement them. And it's been great to also see all the collaborations across um, the globe. We're having our next edition in November. I think there'll also be representatives from this part of the globe again with us. Online registration is still open, so do let us know if you want to participate. And with this, I have a slide for you on community resources. If you're interested a little bit more in seeing how we, from the Elixir angle, manage communities, I'm also very happy to exchange and learn from you how to really engage and foster the people that form the community and make the community. And with this, really just thank you everybody for having me here as well and enjoy the rest of the day and the conference. Thank you. We have time for one question. Um, hi, very interesting talk. Thank you. Um, so I saw infrastructure and I saw all these communities. What's happening with the software? Is that something that you maintain or, you know, how is that uh, managed within Elixir? So the way we work is that the people in our nodes offer services and they can be software, they can be tools, they, they can be anything. So really the maintenance of the things goes back to the people in our infrastructure, in the nodes that are maintaining them. And they kind of commit to doing so with the tools that they offer and bring into the infrastructure. I'm not sure if that answered the question. Happy to chat later as well. Thank you again to all the session speakers. So this brings us to almost the end of today. This is definitely the end of this session. And I'd like to thank all of today's speakers and all of the trainers and also our session chairs who've been doing a fantastic job.